thanks for giving me the opportunity to participate in this symposium today. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is nutrition and CKD guideline update and overview. And in general, what is new and what do we change in terms of the previous guidelines and the new ones that has been published about uh, late August, early September of 2020. These are my disclosures. Uh, the objectives of this talk are primarily to explain a guideline development process, uh, which is primarily a multidisciplinary collaboration between National Kidney Foundation and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics to produce a global evidence-based nutrition guideline for patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, for most of the talk, I will be talking about the differences between the KDOKI nutrition guidelines that was published in 2000 versus the most recent 2020 KDOKI nutrition guidelines. Why do we do this? Just the basic background information so that people understand why we need these guidelines and the update itself. Well, as we all know and appreciate, nutrition in CKD patients is quite complex. This, if I would say, is an oversimplification of the reasons why patients with kidney disease will have uh, nutritional and metabolic abnormalities. And once they have them, the bottom part actually shows the consequences of these abnormalities that really affect the patient's overall well-being and their mortality and morbidity over time. So it is really necessary for the nephrology community to have some guidelines uh, for practice uh, related to nutrition. And again, this was recognized several decades ago, and the individuals that are experts in this uh, specific process have come together and published the first uh, KDOKI nutrition in chronic renal failure clinical practice guidelines. This is a snapshot of that specific publication and you can easily see the basic differences uh, in that uh, publication versus the one that I'm gonna be talking about. First of all, there's about a 20 year, two decade difference. And again, the content and the relevant, relevance of this specific guidelines have changed substantially. And then these guidelines, at least the way they were presented at that time, were not graded, which is a primary basic concept for new guideline development in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So we needed an update. What did we do? About six years ago, we came together with a group of inter international representation uh, and developed a work group members uh, for this update for the nutrition guidelines. One of the most important aspects of these new updated guidelines is its international and global representation. This slide over here shows the pins uh, showing people coming from different parts of the world, including Europe, Asia, Australia, North and South America. So we think this is much more inclusive compared to the previous guidelines that was primarily a North American initiative. And again, at the beginning of my talk, I would like to acknowledge the people who contributed this long uh, process over five, six years. And we, uh, myself and Dr. Lillian Capari from Brazil actually were the co-chairs for these guidelines. And we had three different work groups uh, the micronutrients, micronutrients, and uh, electrolytes and other nutri nutrients. And again, I'm not going to mention the names, but I do appreciate everyone's participation and really, really uh, unbelievable effort to put this unbelievable, the important and relevant document together. Let me give you a little bit of a background information about the guideline development process. It is really important to understand the basics and the process procedures that are need to be taken to produce a guideline that is going to be used by overall practice. So I think this slide is, it might seem a little bit complicated if you just focus on this basic premise over here, conducting a needs assessment and evaluation of the existing guidelines on the topic under investigation. So that's how we started. We actually had a previous guideline. So evaluated the guideline previously published and then need, uh, did another needs assessment in order to see what would be adding to this updated guidelines that was published recently. This specific initial uh, assessment determines the scope of the guideline, which is not that hard, but it could be very really comprehensive in the way that it's being produced. And I'll show you the scope of what we really wanted to work on this uh, guidelines when we first initiated the process. Once you determine the scope, then you go to the next step, which is conducting a systematic review and drafting the uh, guideline recommendations. Now, again, this may seem simple, but in itself, the systematic review takes about three, four years to be able to formulate the question, uh, 
gathered the research, critically appraised the articles, summarized the findings, and developed conclusion statements and degrading the quality of evidence. So this is the part where we really spend most of our time really trying to put this guideline together. Once these draft guidelines are documented and recommendations are put together, they're actually sent out for internal and external review. And based on the recommendations, suggestions that come from the internal and external reviewers, we obtain the approval for evidence-based practice committees and then send them out for publication and what we call an evidence-based practice cycle. So it's critically important to understand that once you publish this guideline, it needs to go to this practice cycle to be actually implemented into our daily practice. What about the question development? So how did we do our needs assessment and how did we develop the scope of this guideline? First of all, you need to go through a PICO format. That is, find out who, which patients, which problem, which intervention, which condition, and which outcomes you're interested in. In basics, the questions were organized by topics and within subtopics by the nutrition care process. Again, we wanted to go through the macronutrients, micronutrients, electrolytes. And then we had an overview of questions within the subtop subtopics that were focused on assessment, intervention, and monitoring. And I will be showing you some examples of these specific three separate questions uh, in relation to the differences that we have for the new guidelines. And that outcomes of interest are, of course, extremely important for all of us. And again, uh, this may seem a very busy slide, but I have to say not all of the outcomes of interest related to nutrition and CKD are presented here. But just to give you an idea, the major categories of outcomes were heart outcomes, nutritional status outcomes, dietary intake, inflammation, and anthropometrics. And then we actually put those outcomes into major categories and we were trying to produce some kind of a format where we can really relate all of these different uh, variables to the outcomes that we're interested in. I'm showing you this slide just to give you an idea of what the scope of this overall initiative is. And it's not a straightforward process. It requires a lot of detailed work. And then finally, you really need to take into account that a guideline should have a great methodology incorporated in itself for its high quality. And again, when we do the great methodology, we assign separate grades for two things. One is the quality of the evidence. And this could be actually assigned by a high, moderate, low, or very low quality. And again, A being the highest, D being the lowest. And then we actually assign a strength of the recommendation. That is, whether the work group actually this thinks this is a level one, a strong re recommendation, or a level two, not so strong or a weak recommendation. So this is an overall, a guideline work of decision. And these are not really black and white decisions, but more of expert opinions for most of the time, as I will show you. So I've been giving you this background information. Uh, let me give you some information about the differences in the updated guidelines. What about the scope? First of all, the KDOKI 2000 guideline had major differences in terms of the population in interest, as well as the dates that it was relevant to. Obviously, uh, the dates, the literature search dates are different because there's a 20 year difference between the two, but we had to actually restrict the literature search to a certain period of time. And we couldn't go more than three decades because there was too many publications. Original uh, KDOKI 2000 guidelines were actually focused on literature search dates between 1996 to 1997, and the new one, the updated one, focused on dates between 1985 till 2016. And again, uh, the fact that we were able to limit our literature search to 2016 gives you an idea that it takes about several years to be able to put the whole document together and then publish. Now, I have to say, during the very latest review, we've tried to incorporate the most recent research that is relevant to outcomes we're interested in. And again, the top population uh, that is under interest was a little bit different between the two guidelines. In 2000, the population included maintenance dialysis and advanced chronic kidney disease uh, patients who were not on dialysis. In our new updated guideline, we incorporated information for adults with chronic kidney disease stages one through five, including dialysis and post-kidney transplant. One thing we did not do was uh, to include patients with acute kidney injury, which was included in the previous guidelines. 
And then what about the topics that are covered? In the original guideline in 2000, the way the topics were uh, outlined included evaluation of protein, energy, and nutritional status, acid base, and nutritional counseling and follow-up. There was also a section on carnitine. In the new version, in the updated version, we more comprehensively covered and added new statements with more evidence-based statements. We also included micronutrients and electrolytes, which was not included in the previous guideline. We did not include carnitine because the literature in this area was not uh, requiring any additional update. Let me give you a couple of examples from assessment uh, uh, guidelines. And assessment guidelines within themselves had seven different categories. I'm just going to talk about the composite nutrition assessment scores and the technical devices that assess body composition, just to give you an idea. And again, if you look at this slide, actually this gives you an understanding of how I'm going to be able to, how I'm going to be presenting the information for you. On the left side, you will see KDOKI 2000 guidelines with what the guideline is about and a small statement about what the guideline recommended. And then in the middle, on the, towards the right side, you will have the new KDOKI AND guidelines 2020, which we've recommended or changed our recommendations. And at the very right, you'll see the changes in, in comparison to the uh, different guidelines, whether they're updated, new, or changed, or skipped the same. Here, I'm showing you the overall nutrition guidelines in terms of global assessments. In the original guideline, it was suggested that SGA, subject to global nutritional assessment, is a valid and a clinically useful measure for nutrition, uh, nutritional status in dialysis patients. But the new guidelines, we actually compare that, consider that this is a valid and a reliable tool, but we also add a new guideline that includes my nutrition inflammation score that could be used to assess the nutritional status. Now I'll show you a basic concept here in this guideline. As you can see for SGA, we provide a 1B recommendation. 1B clearly indicates that there's a quite a high, high quality evidence, but also we have a very strong recommendation. But in return, or in contrast, for my nutrition inflammation score, we provide a 2C that clearly indicates that the level of recommendation is not as strong as SGA, and the quality of evidence is not as good as SGA. But it is still a guideline that requires some in, uh, incorporation into assessment recommendations. What about serum biomarkers? One of the basic differences between the two guidelines is the interpretation of serum albumin concentrations. In the original guidelines, serum albumin was considered as a valid and a clinically useful measure of nutrition status in dialysis patients. Now, in the new guidelines, we actually do not make that recommendation. What we say and recommend with a very strong high level of uh, evidence that a low serum albumin may be used as a predictor of outcomes, specifically hospitalization and mortality. We do not recommend serum albumin to be an assessment tool for the nutritional state. And that is because it is influenced by many other factors than just nutrition alone. So that is a major change, but we still consider albumin as a great tool for prediction or for prognostic markers. And we still recommend checking albumin levels once a month and interpretation by the healthcare worker, whether it's a physician or a dietitian in terms of patient management. What about body composition? And this is the one a little bit, that includes a little bit of an update, but in general, keeps the same guideline as 2000. In 2000, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, DEXA, was considered as a valid and clinically useful technique for assessing nutritional state. In the new guidelines, we actually consider it to be a gold standard. Now, unfortunately, we cannot give you a very strong opinion, even a, a grading for this, but just say opinion, that is an expert opinion, because of the lack of studies that have been published in the subject. But still, it is the gold standard as we recommended for the use for assessment of nutritional state. What about intervention recommendations? And again, this includes seven different subgroups, or actually eight different subgroups. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples that are very relevant to our clinical practice, specifically protein energy and protein energy supplement uh, recommendations for intervention in patients with chronic kidney disease. Let's start with dietary protein intake in patients with chronic kidney disease that are not on dialysis. In the original guideline in 2000, 
uh, there was not a specific uh, high evidence level of a low protein diet intake, as you can see on the left side. And the recommendation was about 0.6 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. Now in the new ones, based on the data that has been accumulated between 2000 and 2020, we recommend that in patients with CKD stage three to five who are not on dialysis and who are metabolically stable, the work group recommends protein restriction with or without keto analogs. And uh, depending on availability, patient preference and clinical judgment to reduce the risk for ESRD death with a very strong recommendation as well as improving quality of life with a low recommendation. And the amount that we recommend is a low protein diet that provides 0.55 to 0.6 grams of dietary protein intake per kilogram body weight per day, or a very low protein diet providing 0.28 to 0.43 grams of dietary protein per kilogram body weight per day with additional keto analogs to meet the requirements to reach the level of 0.55 to 0.6. This is updated. This is a strong recommendation, it's imperative, and a major change compared to the previous guidelines. Now, uh, for patients who are actually who have diabetes, we cannot recommend the same level, and that is because of the lack of data that's been published. Instead, we recommend that for patients with CKD, stage three to five, non-dialyzed, but who also have kidney, uh, diabetic kidney disease or diabetes alone in itself, it is reasonable to prescribe a dietary protein intake of 0 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day to maintain a stable nutritional status and optimize glycemic control. And this is an expert opinion rather than a, a graded recommendation. One difference also between the previous and the new guidelines is the protein intake during acute illness. In the previous guidelines, it was recommended to take more than 1.2 to 1.3 grams per kilogram per day of protein for patients with acute kidney injury or CKD patients with acute illness. In the new guidelines, because of the lack of data and the difference in terms of patient profiles, we've elected not to make any recommendations. So for ones who are really taking care of those patients, we recommend using the previously published guidelines in 2000. What about dialysis patients? There's a slight change in the guidelines between 2000 and 2020. Actually, what we do is instead of recommending greater than 1.2 grams per kilogram per day of protein intake, we recommend 1.0 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per uh, day to maintain a stable nutritional status in chemo and peritoneal dialysis patients. This is applicable to both that patients with bit or without diabetes. And again, a slight change, but again, a, a change that's worth mentioning. Uh, there has been a lot of interest in terms of the protein type for uh, management of patients with chronic kidney disease with their uh, dietary intake. And we did a quite a bit of literature search to be able to find if there's any uh, information that we can use for the protein type uh, to be utilized or to be prescribed in patients with chronic kidney disease. Well, it turns out that most of the data are observational, prospective or retrospective, and there are literally no randomized clinical trials to allow us to provide a recommendation for this specific intake. So what we say is that there's insufficient evidence to make a conclusion about the effects of protein type that is plant versus animal on nutritional status and other outcomes. Now that said, if a patient prefers to take plant protein in general, that is something that is actually acceptable. Whereas if a patient prefers a high animal diet, high animal protein containing diet, we do not recommend that this should be advice for the patients. So there is a difference in terms of opinion for plant versus animal. What about energy intake? Now the energy intake recommendations have changed a little bit, but considerably. Originally in 2000, it was recommended that the patients with CKD, whether on dialysis or not, should take more than 30 to 35 kilocalories per kilogram per day, depending on their age and the metabolic state. We have changed that. And what we've said is that because energy intake is dependent on multiple factors, we recommend prescribe an energy intake of 25 to 35, a wide range, kilocalories per kilogram per body weight per day 
based on age, gender, level of physical activity, body composition, weight status goals, stage of CKD, and the presence or absence of concurrent illness or inflammation in these patients. So what we recommend here is an example of precision medicine or precision nutrition, that is to really look at a patient, determine the patient's need, and change the dietary energy intake prescription depending on the patient's need. A couple of words of the dietary protein intake and dietary energy intake implementation that I believe are relevant to this audience. We recommend gradual implementation uh, instead of one abrupt change in dietary intake. For example, if somebody is ingesting 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram per day, we recommend an implementation of dropping down to 1.2 for a couple of months, then subsequently 1.9, and then go down to 0 0.6. 0.9 and then go down to 0.6 as the patient can adhere and make it available to the patient in terms of really a more smooth transition to a lower protein intake. We also suggest that these dietary interventions regarding dietary protein intake should be uh, more enforced in patients to improve symptoms when chronic dialysis or a transplant is not a treatment option or is to be postponed. And again, Inherently, if wasting is present, priority should be given to correction of wasting rather than implementation of these diets. And then we also recommend that the adherence to these diets should be checked at least three, four times in the first year, and then at least once or twice yearly after year two. What about the nutritional interventions? Well, I'd like to give you this basic information here just to keep in mind. There is a natural progression of nutritional interventions in patients with kidney disease who are at risk or who have protein energy wasting. This starts with nutritional counseling. And then the next step should be addition of oral nutritional supplementation. And if this fails or inadequate, then you go to enteral tube feeding. And then finally, you go to the last resort, which is parenteral nutrition, whether given that intradialytically or as a total parenteral nutrition. So, <clears throat> Did we change anything in terms of nutritional supplementation? I would like to tell you that in the original guidelines, there was not a real direct recommendation in terms of what to do and how to do it. So we've learned a lot in between uh, 2000 and 2020. In the new guidelines, we suggest that in patients with advanced kidney disease and post-transplant who are at risk of or with protein wasting, protein energy wasting, we suggest a minimum of three-month trial of oral nutritional supplements to improve nutritional status. And that is only if dietary counseling alone does not achieve the sufficient energy and protein intake to meet the nutritional requirements. We recommend for people to reassess the patient's response after three months, continue or not to continue, or change the supplementation to another form. And again, unfortunately, despite the uh, obvious need in terms of how to really understand the specifics of oral nutritional supplementation, we unfortunately do not have information in terms of multiple uh, aspects of this specific intervention. These include, we do not know who to give, that is everyone in the dialysis unit or only the ones that are at risk, when to give, for example, during dialysis or in between meals or before dialysis or after dialysis, how much to give, that is to replace what's being lost through dialysis or to supplement over and beyond of what they normally need, how long to give, that is three months or longer, and then finally how to monitor in terms of the response that you see after giving these interventions, supplements to the patients. I think this allows us to think about many different avenues for research in patients with chronic kidney disease regarding their nutritional state and how to intervene on those people. Uh, what about enteral and parenteral nutritional supplementation? Uh, what we recommend is that for patients who cannot attain uh, their nutritional requirements by counseling or nutritional supplement supplementation, then uh, patients should be considered for enteral tube feeding or total parenteral nutrition or IDPN. And again, there's no clear cut recommendation on how to do it and when to do it. And we leave it up to the clinicians and the dietitians' clinical judgment and the patient's overall status in terms of when and how long to give these supplementations parenterally. We do not recommend 
uh, dialysate protein supplementation in patients with peritoneal on peritoneal dialysis. However, in select cases where protein energy wasting is present and when energy intake is inadequate, 1.1% amino acid dialysate with alkali supplements may ameliorate some of the protein deficits in these people and can be considered in, again, select cases. What about uh, vitamins and trace elements? You know, uh, as we all know from the general population, the ideal amounts of daily vitamins and trace elements are those required to maintain health, prevent disease, maintain nutritional status, reverse deficiencies, and also at the same time prevent toxicity. These recommendations in terms of how much to take, i.e. vitamins and trace elements are challenging because it depends on their physical properties, the type of the population, that is a disease population versus general population with a healthy background, depends on body stores and multiple other things, including uh, aspects that are inherent to dialysis, such as losses through the dialysis treatment. So what we recommend is pretty much reflects the dietary allowances for adult general population. As a rule of thumb, in general, because of the lack of data for the treatment properties of these vitamins and micronutrients, we suggest that patients actually take the recommended dietary allowance and be careful about the excessive toxicity rather than for its treatment potential. What about electrolytes? Within the electrolytes, I'd like to talk about uh, sodium and potassium shortly. Uh, the sodium intake and blood pressure uh, seems to be a correlation. And in this new guideline, which was not present in 2000, we recommend that in patients with advanced CKD, dialysis, and post-transplant, we need to limit the sodium intake to less than 100 millimoles per day or less than 2.3 grams per day to reduce blood pressure and improve volume control. Those two outcomes, blood pressure and volume control, are the only two outcomes that have been studied in terms of sodium intake. We do not have any other additional data in order to be able to make any kind of recommendations outside of these two specific outcomes, i.e. blood pressure and volume control. We also recommend that uh, in adults with advanced CKD, not dialyzed, we suggest reducing the sodium intake less than the previously mentioned level of 100 millimoles per day to reduce the proteinuria. And there's strong evidence and strong recommendation to uh, make that statement. And then we also know that sodium intake is actually associated with dry body weight adjustment. So we suggest reducing the sodium intake as an adjunctive lifestyle modification to achieve better volume control and see a, a more desirable body weight in patients with advanced kidney disease, including ones on dialysis. Now, you also have to take into account the fact that there is a, a way of really encouraging for low sodium choice in these patients. Some of these are listed here. I would say these are things that most of the time the dietitians have actually provide information for the patients. I'm gonna show you this list, but just asking patients to look at the label is a good way of really implementing this choice for low sodium intake. And then potassium. Uh, you also have to take into account the fact that there are many other factors than dietary intake that influence potassium levels. So you have to really take all of these into account. But just as a rule of thumb, just think about the main resources or sources of potassium coming from fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, meats, and dairy. So we can change our uh, recommendations or patient management according to these basic concepts. And then finally, uh, phosphorus amount. We actually do not provide a specific information and this specific nutrition guideline does not go into phosphorus management through interventional strategies other than dietary intake. And we recommend to keep the phosphate levels within the normal range based on the lab that is being checked. There are a lot of implementation considerations for phosphorus. We need to emphasize the phosphorus resources. Uh, we advise patients preparing foods at home and we strongly recommend restricting processed foods. Organic fast phosphorus, natural present foods, is absorbed to a lesser extent than in a, inorganic fast, uh, phosphorus, which is available in the food additives. With that, I'd like to close my uh, presentation. And once again, thank to the individuals and the uh, societies that have been really crucial in terms of putting this uh, guideline statements together. Thank you very much.